If you were able to get your coaching business to a million dollars a year, what would you do next? In this video, I interview my client, Ryan Roy, who actually hit that million dollar a year mark and decided to scale his business back temporarily. So in this video, we're gonna talk about the decisions that he made um, that got him to the 100K per month mark, million dollars a year, and why he decided to scale back. We're also gonna talk about a specific book he read early on in the journey that helped him close more sales, the habits that helped him keep going and stay grounded at that 100K per month mark so you can take away the lessons and apply them in your own business. Enjoy. Starting at the beginning, what's the what's the beginning? When's the, what's the beginning? When does the, when does the coaching business take shape for you? Yeah, I um in during COVID, it was a you know shift for all of us, and I think the although it was one of the hardest times and challenges, there there was silver lining, and I think it just shook up a lot of things for a lot of people. And I had been thinking about financial coaching for tattoo artists for a few years. And uh, all of a sudden, I didn't have to go into work every day and do tattoos because I kept thinking someone should do this, but I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm interested, but I don't have enough time. But I had been taking coaching programs my whole life. So there was always a little bit of like a calling, a little thing in the back of my mind. It was like, you'll do something with that one day. And um, so that's when I was like, all right, I'm going to go all in. And I, I'm also the kind of person like I don't half ass if i'm gonna do it i go all fucking in and so yeah it was 2020 that it started um but i didn't know i'm just you're just throwing shit at walls and hoping anything stick you're just flailing around and uh but i think that flailing is really useful in the beginning but i'm not i don't i'm not the kind of person to just flail around for a while and so after that first i think it was like about the first year or so uh, I was on your email list for a little while. Someone had told me about you and I, I always, yours is one of the few email lists that I would actually open and read because it was perfect. It was short, sweet to the point and it offered value. And, uh, I was like, yeah, it was one of the few ones that I actually opened up and read. And so I was like, maybe I'll talk to this guy about it. And like, I kind of already knew that I wanted to work with you, but, um, yeah, it was just uh let's 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 step into the next thing, the next unknown. Let's explore what that looks like. Cuz I had at that point, I think I made around $300 total coaching and I'd spent probably several thousand dollars on all kinds of this and that and courses and certification programs and stuff like that uh that never really helped me get clients. Um they did give me some maybe confidence, but uh I yeah, I I needed some guidance on how to do the business, thing, how to actually make money doing this thing and just dive in. I think I learned more from just jumping into sales calls and marketing and actually like in the trenches of coaching than I ever did spending months in certification programs. And I think that's something I, I heard you talk about and that was my experience as well. Um, so yeah, I started there. I reached out and I was like, all right, we're doing this. I'm going to invest the biggest investment I had ever made in my life into anything into my financial coaching journey. And um, yeah, and like we said, I, I made about 300 bucks at the time up to that date. And I think that was one requirement to work with you is like that you have to have ex exchanged some yeah. money for coaching. You're in so the game. Was, you're yeah. in the game, right? You're not just thinking about it. You're in the game. And yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was confronting. Sales calls really made me they weirded me out and uh that was really helpful to like role play stuff and really shift my perspective around it. It's like uh, I think you said to me one time you said um just a picture that you're someone's in a burning building and you can really help them get out and all you're doing on the sales calls you're just reaching your hand out and you're like do you want to come with me because I can totally help you get out of this burning building and and when I thought about it that way, uh, it really shifted my perspective. You recommended a couple of good books that really shifted. Uh, yeah, spin go, selling, go, I think, was spin helpful. Spin selling was helpful. Go for no. I recommend yeah. go for no to a lot of people just in general in life. It's such a good life advice book. Uh, to If you go for as many no's as you can, you're, you'll end up with more yeses than if you just try to get yeses and try to avoid getting a no. And that that little tweak in perspective. So, 
you know, I'm, I'm still dancing around. I got a couple clients like, okay, cool. We're, this is like starting to take form, take shape. Like I'm, I am in the business of coaching. So that was like probably like the first year and then first two years, you know, uh, kind of doing my own thing then working with you. Um, and I remember I looked in a notebook, I, I journal a lot and, uh, I do a lot of like manifestation journaling and that kind of stuff. And I remember having something where it was like, I, I easily and effortlessly sign on three new clients every month. That was like the mantra, you know? And then when I looked back on that, like less than two years later, I was signing on anywhere between 18 to 25 clients a month. And the date that I had set that by, it was like by 2025. So I'd already, it wasn't even the date by which I was signing easily and effortlessly, you know, three clients. I was already doing 18 to 25 clients a month. So a lot changed very quickly. And um, it's it's been, a, it's just been a roller coaster. Um, but that's how it got started. Yeah. Share um, what you are helping people with, because I know that when you say financial coaching, this comes from your own experience. What was the niche? What was yeah. the focus? Um, so it was primarily tattoo, helping tattoo artists save money, um, save and manage money. Um, so there, I, I did end up getting my license to become a financial advisor and helping with retirement planning and stuff like that tax stuff, but like it really all come, all their money problems can really all come from like, are you living on less than you earn? And everything else can be solved as long as you're living on less than you earn. Um, and tattooers and myself included, I struggled with that for so many years. I made good money. I remember thinking like, man, I probably made, I probably did like 80 to a hundred thousand dollars of tattoos this past year. This is like a five years into tattooing. Like, I don't have any of that money. How is that possible? And it just definitely shook me. And I looked around at a lot of other tattooers that were older than me doing the exact same thing. And it was just like a looking into the my own future. And that freaked me out, honestly. And so that was when I started my own financial journey, reading books. And I, you know, I thought money was evil and all these weird beliefs that we inherit, honestly. Like if I came to you and you're a newborn baby and you have no concept of money, I'm like, what would you like to believe about money, Greg? You wouldn't say, oh, that money's evil. Because like, that's a hard life. You know, if if you have to use money and you think it's the root of all evil, that's a hard life you're signing up for. And so I just kind of started to play around with these concepts of my relationship with money, um, looking at it. You know, also money's the like the biggest taboo on the planet. People will talk about their sex life before they talk about their financial life. And so I think I'm one of those people that like, if you tell me not to go somewhere, I want to go there. And money felt like the biggest no-no. Like, do not talk about it. Don't look at it. It's evil. It's the name that we do not speak of, you know? And so I was like, I want to go there. I want to go in the the weird no-go zone. Even the rebels don't want to go there. Like, I want to go there, you know? Um, so that was that was why. So I I got that kind of somewhat figured out for myself. I figured out some good systems because like I'm I'm kind of a, a little bit of an ADHD artist, scatterbrained. Um, so if I rely on self discipline, I'm relying on a flawed mechanism to do the thing that I need done consistently for the rest of my life, which is save and accumulate money for the future. So I I realized oh, I need better systems and I did that for myself. And so that's what I do is I help tattooers and other people outside of tattooing. We have psychologists, we have uh, other entrepreneurs, real estate agents, even hairstylists. Um, I help them set up systems for saving and investing money for the future. And I help uh, I help them take a look at their relationship with money, those belief systems that are no longer serving them. And I, I you know, I say, if we can help a tattoo artist save money, we can help anybody save money because they why, are- Why is that? There's just, uh, the tattooers are, um, not to be too general, but like there's definitely people that are against the system, against the grain, against the conformity. And what's more conforming than money? It just is like, it's like a conformed unit of time and energy in a tradable format. And it's just like, it's- yeah, you know, um, and so I think I I fell into that category as well. 
And then the, you, as a tattooer, you can also make a lot of cash, which then you don't have to claim and you're making it on a daily basis and it's coming in, but it's irregular. And so it's the hardest way to manage money is when you're getting sometimes lots of money very quickly and easily, and then sometimes no money at all for long periods of time, it's probably the hardest situation to manage money in versus like a stable W-2 paycheck. Um, and tattooers, like I said, very quickly in my career, I was making over six figures as a tattoo artist. And in my early twenties, I had no idea how to, I'd never seen that kind of money before. So, you know, it's easy, easily mismanaged. Yeah, I remember I saw one of your case studies where the person was talking about every day I would just roll my drawer open. I had cash, like yeah. actual cash in front. So it's like, of course, I'm going to go to the nice restaurant. I'm going to go spend yeah. it. It's there. I don't know how much is in there. I'm just going to take <laughs> no. a wad out and, and go somewhere with it. And there's no real sense of that. And then there's like the immediate gratification of making money relatively quickly. It's possible. Um, but then... There's also this, I remember thinking I wasn't going to live past 25. Like when I was like a teenager in like early 20s, I was like, I live fast, die young. And so you're not thinking about like, I might be 80 years old one day. And I think that realization also hit me in my early 20s. I was like, I I got sober when I was 26. And I was like, I'm probably going to live longer than I think. And so if no one does anything about that, like no one's going to do that for me. No one's going to come along and be like, oh, Ryan, you didn't prepare for being 50, 60, 70 years old. So here we are here. Let's help you out. No one's going to do that. It's up to me. And so, um, yeah, I, I now help people take a look at that relationship. I, I, I view it like your inner child. You have an inner elder. You have this older version of yourself that you are right now in this moment responsible for helping and taking care of them and actually building a relationship with that inner elder rather than, you know, inner child too. do the inner child work do the inner elder work, be a whole and complete human being. And, uh, and honestly, when I hear clients say that, like, dude, money's like, it's kind of fun. Like I actually am enjoying dealing with spreadsheets and profit loss statements and understanding these concepts. I'm like, Oh, you got the bug. Like that thing that I got infected with you, you it's contagious. You've, you've been infected, you know, and that's the best thing to serve you for the rest of your life. Yeah, I love that. I think we touched on this a little bit when I visited you in New York and we got a coffee. It's like as a coach, one of your main jobs is to make the expertise that you share, make it so it's now intrinsically exciting to the person that's the client, right? So for me, if I'm helping people with marketing or sales, at the point where sales became kind of fun or marketing became interesting, let me figure this out. Like I like getting leads. Like, it's cool. I make money. Like it's, it's interesting making content at that point. Now you're empowered to go take it on. And so for your niche, it was money, right? If money is a scary thing, I don't want to deal with. There's not a lot you can do there. Well, as soon as money becomes fun and interesting, yeah, you can help the person, but they kind of got it. You know, yeah. you kind of did your job. Absolutely. That's what I want people to leave with. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about this first phase, which was a lot about sales. That's from, you know, $300 total to what, like 10K per month is about sales? Right. Yeah. I think that was, uh, I remember when I started hitting pretty consistent 10K months, I was like, wow. And like, I only needed at the price point, I only needed about two to three clients a month at the time to, uh, to hit that. And, um, and I was doing one-on-one -on -one coaching and I was like, I, I've got this, you know, I figured this out. I started getting a wait list of clients because there was no one else in tattooing doing what I'm doing. So I'm in a blue ocean, as they say, you know, there's no other tattoo artist who have a tattoo background, financial coach that is helping tattooers do this. So I, I had no competition. So when people started to hear and now tattooers also another thing about them, they're very skeptical. They think everything is a scam. And I don't blame them. Like, I get it. There's a lot to be skeptical of out there, you know? So people would group me in, but they needed the help so badly that they were like, ah, maybe so Ryan kind of sounds like he knows what he's talking about. He doesn't seem like a bad guy. And so um, I started to build this wait list of one-on-one -on -one clients. And then I realized I have a six month wait list because I could only work with like six or seven clients at a time. I was still tattooing a little bit. Um, I have a kid, family, and um, I was 
taking half up front. I think I was charging $6,000 for one-on-one coaching at the time. I would take half up front and then I'd say, okay, cool. See you in six months. And it was just crazy. I couldn't do, I couldn't keep doing that. And so that was when I first was like, okay, I'm going to do a small group program to dip my toe in the, the world of group coaching. Uh, and I would say like the difference between one-on-one -on -one coaching and group coaching is like one-on-one -on -one is like lion taming and group coaching is like dragon taming. And like, you're not even taming this dragon. You're just on it and it's going for a ride and you're just like trying to hang on to this thing, especially an evergreen program, which anyone isn't familiar with the evergreen. It's like, there's no like, okay, you're okay. Four months of coaching and now we're opening up and launching again. This is every single month you're signing on 18 to 25 clients and they're all kind of looped in and it's just this, it's a beast. Um, it was, it was scary. Again, I had hired, I'd worked with other coaches and other programs to help me make that transition from one-on-one -on -one to group coaching. Um, but, but yeah, I remember you would help me write a sales page for that first group coaching program. And I remember it felt like this magical thing that I wrote a page. I put these words in a particular order and it, other people saw that and that page sold $20,000 worth of coaching without a single sales call. I was like, this is magic. This is like a magical spell, you know? And um, and they all got a ton of value out of it. And I was like, okay, that's, yeah. So sort of like learning all these tools as I build my coaching business. Um, Cause you can be a good coach. You can be a great tattoo artist, but you're not great at business. And you know, you can be a great coach, but yeah, you have to learn the business side of things. And, and if you, get excited about it, that's that's even better. I want to highlight a couple things you said. One that I think is important is this idea of you had filled a, sort of an unmet need for this specific group of people. And that just, I think, makes the game a lot easier. It seems yeah. like it has for you. And I'll also say, and I don't know if you fully remember this, but it actually took a second for you to decide to really commit to speaking to tattoo artists because there was a phase where it was more financial coaching for like more creative entrepreneurs. And it was kind of there was a hesitancy to really speak to that group. But that's like you like that's who you could kind of give the most clear value to at the beginning. Of course, now it can still broaden out. But I think there was a turning point. We were like, let me speak to my people even more. And for those people, yeah. it was like nobody was specifically helping them with their finances. Nobody that they trusted because it was one of them, you know? Yeah. And actually, I'm glad you're bringing that up because I, I did forget that. Yeah. In the beginning, it was like, my company's the Artful Dollar. We're here for artists and it's still the Artful Dollar. But I, yeah, there was some fear and like, but I can help those people. But it really, I don't know why we get so afraid to niche down and tighter and tighter. And actually I'm niching down even tighter now um, so yeah, I went from artists to tattoo artists. So then our marketing really just focused on tattoo artists. Now I've realized I, I shouldn't be focusing on all tattoo artists. I should really be focusing on tattooers that are interested in personal and professional development and really also like their, their spiritual practice, um, or their, their spiritual perspective on the world, because I take a very spiritual approach to my relationship with money. Um, and there are a lot of tattoo artists that need help with their finances that are not interested in that. And so I built a rather large following, you know, 30,000 followers on Instagram, but I realized a, so, a large portion of them aren't ever going to work with me because they aren't actually interested in the work that I really find to be transformative. And, um, and so uh, in, in niching down, in changing our marketing strategy, and I, I think marketing is all about being authentic. The more authentic you can be, the more you will deeply resonate with your ideal clients and the more you will push away. It's polarizing. You'll push away people that you don't want to work with. I'm actually uh, losing followers right now. And I know that, and I'm actually totally cool with that. I'm very intentional. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's clear out the people that, yes, they need the help and they like the quick tips and tricks that I share, but they're never really going to work with me. And it's never going to really transform their life because the, I, the work that I know to be the most powerful isn't what they're interested in. So I'm sharing more content on that spiritual perspective. I know people are going to judge it and feel weird about it and whatever, so what I've found, and this is my, you know, learning and building content and social media strategy is um, 
there's posts that go shallow and broad. They get a lot of eyes, a lot of attention. They go viral or whatever. But a lot of times that content isn't what grows your business. It's the content that goes short and deep where you only get a couple hundred likes or something, but you get like 13 comments. You get a couple really good shares from people that it resonates deeply with. And so while it doesn't look good in terms of the metrics of, you know, I've gotten things with close to 500,000 views, um, it, it actually is better for the business. And so anyone who's working on content, I think you should do both. You should do shallow and broad, but don't forget to go, you know, short and deep with those people that are your, your real quality followers. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. What, um, so pick up at the, you launched that course and it was sort of a group program, but you were saying it was, it wasn't evergreen at that point. It was like, this was your right. first program sales page, learn the power of copywriting. What happens next in your journey or what's the next skill that you've got to stack on top of that? So then I had to, I, I hadn't, I had, I had, been doing social media, but I knew I still had a lot to learn and I still have a lot to learn. But um, I was looking for a, a coach that could not just help with social media, but also help me move onto a group and, and an evergreen program. I didn't even realize that I needed or wanted an evergreen program, but when I started to understand the concepts of that um, and really leaning into social media, um, which is a powerful tool, but it's also scary and weird and frustrating as hell. Um, I, I had found someone to help me with that. And I also, I think what differentiate, why I chose that particular program versus others was there's so much stuff out there that talks about running ads. And then this was talking more about organic growth and no ads at all. And I liked that idea that like, let me focus on the strategies that build that organic growth and following and then run ads later. So we actually only recently started running ads after building a seven figure coaching business. We just started to run ads. And you were really focused on Instagram specifically, right? Like that's yeah. where you really doubled down, which I think makes sense. I'd imagine that that's a big place for tattooers. Yeah. Um, there's a few reasons why I just focused on Instagram and still to this day, I mean, I'm getting more on YouTube and stuff like that. But um, one is I, I heard that even though there's all these other platforms and there was so much temptation and advice, go to TikTok, it's grow, blowing up like this, to focus on getting really good at one platform at a time. And I don't regret doing that um, because I, I learned to really hone my craft on the type of content and the way to engage with people on that platform. Cause it is very different on other platforms. Um, and also Instagram is still like, uh, it's, it, it's an easier platform to connect with like socially. I feel whereas TikTok, uh, even YouTube, you're not like building these conversations and these deeper, you know, yeah, like DMing people, like you can DMing DM people. people. You yeah. can DM people. Yeah. You can DM anyone. I mean, I've DM, I've reached out to people that I wanted on my podcast and I was like, oh, this person's never going to answer my DM. And they do. And they come on. Like it's pretty powerful that you can just reach out to almost anyone. It's, it's compared. I think uh, I heard Gary V talk about it in the same way that like when email first came out, like if you had someone's email, you could email them and they were going to want, they were going to read it. You know, if you somehow got Bill Gates's email when that shit first popped off, like Bill was going to read your email now. No, but DMing is kind of like that still to a certain degree um, that there's a good chance that people will see it up into a certain point. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So what was working for you when you said, all right, I'm going to do the evergreen coaching program. I'm going to focus on Instagram and I'm going to focus on supporting tattoo artists with managing their finances. What started to work that allowed you to go up to hundred K a month? Um, I, well, first I was just shooting cold DMS to random tattoo artists. And I, I remember we were working together and I was like, you were like, what's going to really make a difference for you? Like we've gotten this far, we've seen these results, but it felt like we hadn't yet. Like, crossed a certain threshold of like, all right, this fucking thing works. You know, yeah. we'd seen some yeah. results and I was like, I think I just need to just reach out to people. And I know a lot of them are going to say no, or they're going to leave me on unread. 
But if I just reached out to like 10 people a day or something like that, I will uh, slowly, you know. This is the lighthouse game, this right? Is, so this is All where about I- about the lighthouse game. Yeah, this, this is where right. I came up with the concept of the lighthouse game. So, you know, we were talking about blogging, I think at the time, which I think my audience less is, SEO is less of a strategy for them, but it's still a good strategy. But I- I knew I was like, I need to be blogging and I need to be making content and I need to be reaching out to people. And it all felt hard and weird. And I was just like, maybe I just need to give a point system to everything. If I did one of these per week, I did this every day and I did this per month. And if I came up with this point system, I'm like, all I have to do is earn a hundred points a month. So if I don't do the one thing a week, but I make up for it with the daily thing, or if I don't do the monthly thing, but I make up for it with the weekly thing, or it doesn't matter what combination, I will be shining my light brightly and shining my light regularly. And that's all it takes to market yourself. Um, and 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 doing it, you know, regularly doing it consistently. So brightly, yeah, and, consistently, that's it. And so you so gamified I, the process of marketing, the actions you needed to do to get awareness, turn it into a game. Yeah. And so what that did was it took my focus off of getting clients or making money. And it just put my focus on the things that I needed to do that would naturally result in getting clients and making money. And so I was like, just earn your points, just get your point. And then I, I actually got this like daily um, satisfaction out of hitting my daily points, hitting my weekly points, that little like hit of serotonin. Like I did it. I did the thing that I said I was going to do. Whereas if you're relying on sales or clients, you're not always going to get that every day. And so it can be hard to be consistent with it because you're not getting your little serotonin dopamine kick. Yeah. Yeah. Did you track this or visually or like, how were you keeping track of the points for yourself? I was tracking it. Um, I think I started, I was just texting you like every day or something. I was like, yeah. Greg, I need daily accountability. Yeah. Right now that's what I need. And I started by doing that. I think I had a sheet. And then um, after a while, it it just became the habit and it it stopped. I stopped tracking points. I, I remember I was, that. Yeah. I was like, hey, how's the lighthouse game going? And you're like, I don't know. I'm just making a lot of money now. Yeah. Yeah. At that at that point, <laughs> like, I'm just reaching out to a ton of people, a ton of people. And uh, yeah, it, it was. And so I didn't know at the time that there's this uh, I didn't know about appointment setting or appointment setters, that that's even a thing. And, um, and there's a whole skill set behind setting an appointment, building a gap in either a phone call or a DM conversation, building that genuine connection, and then inviting people on the call. I wasn't building any gaps. I was just like, hey, I do this thing. I know this is weird, but this is how I help people. If that sounds interesting, you let me know. I can shoot you a link to book a call. Thanks. Bye. You know, and just, just mass blasting that as much as Instagram would allow me to. And, um, and that was how I got, that's how I hit my first 10 K months was just doing that. Yeah. And just, you, so you were searching for tattoo artists, searching for these people and yeah. reaching out Instagram DM. Yeah. Didn't know, didn't have a strategy for it really. Just get the reps in. Spray and pray. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you know what? what? I, I've been in coaching groups, like Facebook groups where people talk about those strategies and they like, they like kind of poo poo it like, oh, don't do that. And that's weird or that's annoying. And it's like, you know what? Maybe five people got annoyed out of it, but like on a scale from one to 10, like how annoyed were they? Like one being like, I lightly brush up against you. 10 being like, I stick my finger in your eye. Like they were maybe a two. And then the people that I actually got on a call and then ended up working with, like how much did it change their life? Like a fucking 10. Like people that have never saved money historically in their whole lives have saved their first 10, 20, 30, 40, $50,000. It, so I was like, is that worth it? Slightly inconveniencing someone for a f three seconds of their day in order to completely radically change lives. Like to me, that trade-off felt worth it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What, what comes next? So you're doing the cold reach outs. You're starting to get traction. I'm doing that. And um, I, I signed up with this company that, you know, helped me understand a little bit more of a framework for, you know, like creating content that not only educates, but like busts commonly held beliefs. So if someone already believes something and then you're speaking about the thing that they already believe, but that it's wrong or that to think about it in this new way, that's engaging, that's hooking. 
Um, people don't like their beliefs challenged. They also don't want to believe something that's wrong. So when you're kind of challenging that, um, you know, just different frameworks for how to how to do CTAs, how to, you know, really not just provide value, but get people on calls and just strategizing. And so I, I took, I don't know how many sales calls I took in the first month that I launched my evergreen program. This is, I think October of 2022 is when it launched the, the month in the two months leading up to that, I did $30,000 off of some of the, the strategies that they had taught me to, to book calls. And, um, and then the next month I did $80,000 of sales myself taking my own sales calls. And I don't know how many calls I took that month, but it must've been like 40 fucking sales calls or something around there. And, um, I remember thinking like, this, this is insane. Like I used to make this in a year and I just made that in a month. And, um, that was when I was like, all right, I need to hire someone to take sales calls for me. Um, I need to hire an assistant. I need to, someone had recommended um, that I hire a COO to just help with like building out aspects of the company, which I would have never done that. It was actually Mike Taylor. I don't know if you follow Mike Taylor on Instagram. He's a no. used to be a professional skateboarder. And then he went into private equity investing. And then uh, now he's in like local government in California. Super nice guy, super smart guy. And I don't know, it's just like that skateboarding to finance tattoo to finance connection. So, um, cool. he was like, you need to hire a COO, someone to manage that. And, um, I'll, I'll share something about that in a little bit, but I, yeah, I was like, I started to build a team and that was exciting for me. I was like, this is cool. Like there's a, there's a team being built here. And I was terrified of having someone do sales for me because i'm like these are tattoo artists you're gonna get on this call and they're gonna give you one look and be like where are your fucking tattoos at who the fuck are you but when i met him he was so genuine and he had such empathy and compassion for people and i was like this is because there's a lot of weird sales people out there there's a lot of weird closers and like that whole world of sales reps no nothing against them i think sales is a beautiful art form now it really is but uh, it can be a weird world. And so I wanted to make sure that the people that the guy that was representing me was a, a good representation of me. And so I was very fortunate that actually I signed up for like an entrepreneur. Um, I almost call it like support group or something like that. It was like a it was like a mastermind, you know, whatever Facebook metric group, a bunch of people doing, you know, 10 multiple five, six figures a month. And I never really went to many of the classes, but the networking alone in that group was what introduced me to this closer who mm -hmm. ended up doing, you know, $700,000 of sales in one year. And I was like, that it was worth the, the 10 K I invested in the mm -hmm. entrepreneur program yeah. that I never even participated in. The networking was all, I got all the value out of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great takeaway. And you do have to, you have to put your chips in occasionally. Like you have to be investing in this stuff. I, one of the things I wanted to mention, and then I want to hear your, the COO thing that you're going to say about yeah. hiring that person. But, um, I feel like if someone's listening to this earlier on, they're still in the sales part of the journey. Yeah. There's always this thing of like, I don't want to be pushy or scammy. Yeah. Which I totally. get, I'm sure you hear it too. Totally. I think what people don't rise is like, if you were good at sales, you wouldn't be that way anyway. Right. There's some sense that like, oh, in order to really succeed at sales, I'd have to be pushy. And it's like, no, if you're doing that, it's not working. Not like working. You fuck something up, right? Because like really, as soon as that would happen, that would be losing you sales. Right. Um, the best sales people that you'll interact with, you'll never feel like you're being sold to. And so I always just like, once you see that later in the journey, it just almost doesn't make sense when people start saying that. It's like, yeah, that's not what we're going to teach you anyway. So Right, right. And same for marketing. You know, it's like it, mm. weird, cheesy, you know, salesy marketing is not good. It's not authentic. It, it That wouldn't be authentically you. So therefore, don't do that. You know, yeah. the best feeling is when someone signs up for your program and they go through it and they're a month in or whatever. And they're like, Ryan, I am so glad I wasn't going to do this. Like I, I was scared and you, you stood for me and they, they might even say the words like, I, I'm glad you pushed me a little bit. Right. They might say yeah. those words, yeah, but they're you. so glad they're so grateful because there is this fear because there's your old belief systems and then you're 
rewiring and creating new perspectives and belief systems, but you have to jump over that crevice that, you know, is hard. And that's what you're doing. You're taking a stand for someone seeing what they're truly capable of and living into that future. And it's a scary moment for them. But if you're honest and authentic, they're going to trust you. They're going to grab your hand and be pulled out of that burning building and they'll be grateful for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. What, would, what were you going to say, if you remember about the COO piece? Um, well, one, I was, I remember I put an ad on LinkedIn for, to hire like a part-time COO. And uh, we were, we were doing like on average, like 30 to 50 K of revenue a month. Here's the other thing I have to just disclaimer. When you make those numbers, you're not taking home that much money not even fucking close. And honestly, like I would take home very similar numbers to when I was doing three to four clients a month, one-on-one, -on -one, when I was doing 15 clients a month. And it was very deceiving. So there was a bit of a- Because the build. costs are higher. Revenue is higher, costs are higher. Yeah. Profit is similar. So when I hired the sales rep and the COO and the assistant coach to fulfill on all this new traffic- my take home was like the same, but I'm, I have all these other people doing stuff. I have more responsibility. At one point, our weekly payroll was $10,000 a week paying out to the team. And it was just like, oh my God, it was such a heavy, it was stressful, dude. It was so stressful. Um, and there were so many times where I'm like, I should just go back to one-on-one -on -one coaching because it's way less stressful and I'll make basically the same amount of money. Um, so I just had to put that disclaimer in it. Yeah, I'm um, glad you said that. Yeah, no, for real. And, and people... I think if I heard that, if I, if someone, if I listened to a podcast early on and I heard someone say that, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm fucking telling you, like, you're not going to make that much more money when yeah. you start doing six figures a month. And I, I was in mastermind groups with other people doing six figures a month and they said the same thing. I think that part of that might be a little bit of the employee mindset hanging on too. Because it's like you hear someone saying, oh, the business is generating 100K a month. And you're like, holy shit, this person's making $100,000 a month that's going into their personal account. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. That's revenue. Yeah. The, I mean, I'll share honest numbers. The, we, we ended up doing, um, and I, I, I know I'm jumping around here. We ended up doing a million dollars in 2023 of gross revenue, which blew my mind that that even happened. So from 20, 21, when I first started to work with you, 2022, we did 300K, 350K. And then in 2023, we did over a million dollars. It blew my mind that we even created something that people wanted that brought value and they paid for and, and seven figures was generated. But I total took home about 250K that year, which is, that's great. Like, that's awesome. But to I had to generate a million dollars to generate 250K. I could have done that one-on-one. -on -one and not works nearly as much as I did easy. Right. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's really a helpful metric for people to, to get. Yeah. The, the, so you, you have to, and we were talking about teams, like you have to want to work with a team. Like that really excites me. You were kind of sharing it. Like you had started to do that and you started to feel like maybe this isn't for me or it's not at least right, right now or in your career. Um, but so back to the COO. So I I hired uh, this random woman from Rhode Island to uh, uh, you know help grow this company, and it was instrumental in you know dealing with payment systems and processing payments and understanding how and then automations backgrounds in the software. And I don't know if you use Go High Level. If anyone's listening to this and use Go High Level, have someone help you with that shit. It is so complicated. And I just needed someone to help with all the back end stuff of running a business so that I could focus on making content and coaching people. And like, those are like the main two things that I do in the company. Um, and um, I guess what I was going to share is, which I'll, I'll, I'll gladly share now is that it, it ended up turning into a, a really beautiful relationship and uh, we ended up falling in love uh, with my COO who I met on LinkedIn. So if Tomai is listening to this, she's going to freak out that I'm even mentioning her, but shout out to my, shout and that, out to so that's my, yeah. now something you've shared with the team and everyone. Yeah. 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 We shared with the team. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, what was that like starting 
a relationship with the COO and then being like, is this messy? Can I do this? And then, oh yeah, it was totally terrifying. More open, like what's, what was that process for you? I don't recommend it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually that's not true. It's actually fucking awesome because we are both so passionate about what we do and we get to share that passion with each other. And it's so much fun to build something really big. And so we share in the highs and we share in the lows. I mean, I, I'm so grateful that it ended up somehow working out this way that I put an ad for a COO on LinkedIn and ended up meeting like yeah. the love of my life. Like seriously, she gets me, she sees me in all the good and the bad and she accepts me for who I am and, and vice versa. It's like, it'll either dating someone that you uh, are creating a company with will either be your demise or it'll be your superpower. And so it's like, you're kind of like flipping a coin on that. You're like, and and I in our case, it definitely has been a superpower. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of people I feel like are, they're doing the online dating thing. They're on Tinder, they're on Hinge. I think the best way is probably to put, you got to put the ad for the COO. That's, That's how to the find move. love. That's in, the move. In today's world, it's really yeah. the only way to find love. LinkedIn. LinkedIn <laughs> is the dating app of 2024. People are overlooking LinkedIn for dating. Um, okay, <laughs> so that's great. So that's really exciting. Yeah. What else is like, I don't know, what, what else has been on your kind of edge right now in terms of things you're realizing, things you're learning with the business? Yeah, so I very proud of what we've created and accomplished. And at the same time, I, you know, there's what I wished, what I, it's weird. It's like, there's things I wished I knew then, but at the same time, I don't think I would have done anything differently. So there was this excitement about building this business. It's growing quickly. Let's invest in this. Let's hire this. Um, it, it was an exciting opportunity. Seeing the numbers get bigger is exciting. Da, 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 you know, all this stuff. But it was fucking killing me. Like personally, emotionally, spiritually, I was like getting drained. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of people like Alex Ramosi and stuff like that, who was like, this is the hard stuff and this is what you do. And, you know, do the hard stuff because no one can chase you there, you know? And, and if you can do it and um, it... And so I'm, I kind of feel like I have to hold two separate belief systems. It's like one, yes, doing hard things can be valuable and build character and teach you lessons you can't pay for. So I learned lessons in the past couple of years that no coach could fucking teach me. Um, and I, at that time I had reached out to you or maybe you reached out to me and we were just chatting. I reached out to you. You reached out to me and you were like, Hey, I'm, you know, kind of working on this other thing, just like some performance coaching and stuff like that. If you want to talk about it. And I was like, actually, yeah, I do want to talk about that because I felt like the things that were uh, really needed to stay grounded and keep my energy, my creative energy to do what I was doing. I wasn't in a habit of the practice, the sleep schedule, the work schedule, the meditation schedule. And so we had kind of talked about that. And I saw that like, it was this whole thing was going to crumble if I crumble mentally. And so I was like, let's, let's, let's look at my schedule. Uh, eventually managing money, like managing money is always important, but managing time becomes more important than managing money at a certain, at a certain point. Yeah. Time and, and your energy too. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was a, a, a life changer in looking at my schedule, realizing where my like peak kind of hours for certain activities are. I remember we did that. We moved, I stopped taking meetings in the morning. Um, we looked at like, you know, just simple things like meditation, exercise, those things that will fill the tank that will keep me going over the long run. And, um, and so that that was crucial, I think, in surviving that that year of like yeah. hitting hitting uh, hitting a million. I think it was right after that that we started to work together again. But yeah, I, I was so burnt out. I felt so gutted, and I was like, I can't keep doing this the way I'm doing it. So that was a helpful beginning to shifting my perspective. And then when you build a business so quickly, you're you don't have time to learn lessons that can only be learned over five plus years. 
And your industry, my industry at least, and all industries, they change rapidly. So there's been so many changes in the tattoo industry. Our focus has gone not a little bit less on financial coaching, more on marketing education and how to grow your tattoo business while still managing the finances. So our, our focus changes. And um, I couldn't... I couldn't keep working the way that I was. And I had to face that. And that was a scary realization, I think. Um, especially around content. And and that's what I'm saying, like how we were niching down more with our content. We were like in this cycle of, you know, lead magnet, lead magnet, lead magnet, webinar, lead magnet, lead magnet, webinar, like every single month. And it was seeing great results at first, but you start to see diminishing returns. After any marketing strategy, you will start to see diminishing returns. And um, there was something that just didn't feel authentic about the whole approach. And while it was producing results, it was starting to produce diminishing returns. I was feeling gutted. And I, I really had to like rethink, what do I want? What are my priorities? What's actually important to me? Um, I felt like we had built this business with a lot of paper, like we burned a lot of paper. We got this big roaring fire going and you just had to keep throwing the paper. And as long as you threw the paper in, the fire would keep burning. But we never really built the coals that uh, it could fucking rain and that those embers will still survive, you know? And so that's the, uh, started to take a bit of a longer term perspective. You came to New York, uh, actually that book that you gave me, um, Anything You Want, yeah, Derek, um, Derek Sivers. Yeah, I, I haven't finished it, but I started, I read probably about half of it. It's a short book. And that really started to shift my perspective of like, I've built this business doing all the things that all the people I look up to do and all the coaching courses told me to do and I did it and it worked. But something still feels like it's missing. And that book really showed me like, you can build a business any fucking way like you can do it like there are no fucking rules and you know some of the the themes of like you know really do what is best for your clients always first and foremost do what's best for your clients everything else is secondary to that i think we've always held a very high standard for the service that we deliver our clients but you know if, if i think if any business is honest with themselves there's always more you can do there's always ways you can improve that um and then like the type of content I felt like I had to make, it felt like it wasn't fun for me. It wasn't exciting. And so if it's not exciting, even if I'm good at it and I have this skill of how to grab the attention and build the hook and the copywriting and all this stuff, it's still not going to resonate deeply like I was just kind of saying. So um, after reading that book and we we decided to let go of our sales rep which was a really scary move. And I deeply love that guy. We're still kind of work together in some consulting capacity, but I was like, we need to, I actually don't want to make a million dollars this year. Like I really don't want, if it happens, I'm not going to be mad at it, but like, I don't even want to try to do that. I don't want, I'm, I am not attached to outperforming financially what I did last year because now my perspective is like, I want to build the coals. I just want to worry about building the coals that make this business a legacy. And the same tools and strategies and perspectives that you use to grow a business are not the same tools and strategies and perspectives that you use to build those coals and nurture those coals. And so that's now been our focus. I don't know that I would have gained this perspective had I not played the game of business the way I did. And I, I always think you need to have the breakdown in order to have the breakthrough you've always been looking for. But if you don't have that breakdown, you'll never have that breakthrough. I needed to have that breakdown. So I could say, knowing what I know now, would I done things differently? Maybe not, because I, I wouldn't have had that very important breakdown emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Um, and it's, uh, it's although it's scary, like we're ste stepping into some unknowns, um, it's really exciting. Yeah. I love that sense of restraint too, because that's its own type of discipline of saying, yes, there's a place for more, 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 but there's also a place to slow down 
and make sure that we have a wide enough foundation that it's durable, it's deep, can go wide, it can stay there for a long time. Yeah. And, and so also noticing when stuff isn't sustainable for you too. You know what I mean? Like you can do the meditation every day. You can get that focused work done in the morning and that you do have to do that. But there's also some changes you can make to the business. Yeah. Yeah. And that was probably the hardest part about this whole thing was recognizing that changes need to be made. And they were basically abandoning the things that we knew worked really well for a while completely abandoning them and then having to like figure it out almost from scratch. But the truth is it's not from scratch. You know, we have skills, we have knowledge under our belt. Um, but that was the hardest, the hardest thing so far was that kind of realization in, in just the past couple months. And this is pretty fresh for you. This is very fresh. What, yeah. Did something happen specifically? Was there a moment where you were like, okay, we need to shift things or did it happen more gradually? So I would say there's been a series of moments like there was, um, I mean, you know, we're, we're also, we're a financial coaching company. So like, but here's the thing, managing finances and managing a business are two very different things, very different things. And so, you know, and I had never, I I'm still new to managing this level of finance of money. And I've had to rebuild my systems differently to manage certain levels of, of revenue. Um, but we, we've seen some big challenges financially for the company, you know, when certain marketing things don't work out or we've had a, a tax situation and then a thing client, you know, it's just like all these like different things that come up that every business has to deal with, whether you're a financial coaching business or a tattoo business or anything. And I, there was one time where we like, we had $10,000 in the bank and we had about $10,000 of payroll due at the end of the week. And I, I like, I'm almost like embarrassed to admit this, but it, it just, it happens. It can happen to the best of you, you know, of any business. And then, uh, and then we were hit with this like crazy tax bill that ended up being nothing like fuck the tax system because they will scare the shit out of you. Even <laughs> if you don't owe them anything, but they'll send you a big bill and they'll just hope that you pay it. And if you contest it, it turns out to be nothing. But I was like, fuck me. How are we going to do this? Like it's fucking over. Like, I don't even want to do, I don't want to do this anymore. Managing the team. And then, and then we switched gears. We came up with a new offer. And I remember seeing all these like videos on Instagram where the people were like, yeah, I was in the hole and this, and then I fucking sold my way out of it. Like that's what we did. And it was so cool. It was so badass. And we made a better program that helped a ton of people make a lot more money. And it was just like, awesome. We're getting crazy good testimonials. But it was like that. Then, then we kind of ran into like similar problems. We didn't have the coals. That was the problem. We didn't have. And honestly, when I'm speaking about coals, to be more specific, I think I'm talking about brand. Yeah. Like I'm talking about a deep, resonant trust in you, your product, and your your brand, your message that you can really only build over time. It's yeah. not like you can just trick an industry into building an immense trust in your brand. It's just showing up consistently for a long fucking time, doing the right thing, doing right by your clients, you know, giving people what they want, giving people value for free for a long period of time. That, those are the coals. And yeah. that's, that's what we hadn't built yet. And so I think there was a realization. It was like, we we did the thing, we sold our way out of it, and we're still running into similar problems that actually we weren't solving those problems. We were just throwing more paper onto the fire. Right. Like, do I need to keep? Yeah, I think that's a great analogy. It's like, I can do it again, sell my way out of it again. I'm just going to have to push again and a push yeah. again versus like, how can I make it so this becomes easier and easier and easier because of the reputation that's getting built, because of the referrals, because of all that. And you can have negative reputation, which is not what was happening to you, where it gets harder and harder. You can have positive where it's just easier and easier. Or you can have it where you're like, okay, let me slow down and and build the coals. Like you're saying, yeah. I think that's really smart because I think otherwise you end up in the same situation two months from then. So that was the realization. The realization was we we're not going to solve these problems. Like Einstein, you can't solve a problem at the level it was created 
we can't sell our way into building the coals, the deep trust and brand that we ultimately need. So let's shrink the company. We ended up letting go of some people, pulling back on some people's um, responsibilities. I lowered my pay. I lower, you know, we damn near lowered everyone's pay uh, at least a little bit, uh, except for our coach, Chloe, the assistant coach. She is such a phenomenal human being. And I was like, there's no fucking way I'm, I'm lowering her pay. Like, she's just like, she's too fucking good. She's too valuable. I love her. So shout out to Chloe. Shout out Chloe. Um, and uh, I would say people come to work with me, but they stay to work with her. You know, she's she just brings so much value to our clients. And um, and I'm I'm happier. I'm making less money. I'm making content that I feel better about. I'm having better conversations with people, whether we work together or not, doesn't matter. And I'm in a happier place than I was a couple months ago. And that is just a really cool realization. So that's, yeah. I was excited to, share that with you because we've oh. been talking for a while and there was some, yeah, I was, I was pretty, I was an unhappy camper for a while. Um, but yeah. That's so great. And I'm glad that the, the Derek Sivers book was part of that. I think for anyone, there's a specific chapter in that book that you reference, which is what I always think about when I think about that book, about everything you do is for your customers. Any decision you make, if you're thinking your customers will never ask you to expand They'll, right. but they'll ask you for certain things that may require expansion. Sure. But if you ever get confused, go ask your customers what they need. And I just thought that was so simple and so amazing. But the what you've done, which a lot of people fail to do, not to mention, I mean, I think it's like only maybe 1% of entrepreneurs hit the million dollar revenue mark. Um, yeah. But I think what can sometimes happen is people build this monster that eats them alive and then they're done. They're out of the game. Oh, yeah. Because they can't say, okay, yes, there's some short term selling I need to do. And let's steady the ship, which takes a lot of fortitude. And then let's take a look at what's going on to make this sustainable. And sometimes that means hard conversations, it sounds like, and like ratcheting down people's pay and stuff like that. And that sucks. It's yeah. the harder road, but you stay committed to the mission long term. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I always say like business is the ultimate spiritual crucible because it forces you to surrender. It forces you to trust. And if I had to put all my faith in Ryan Roy, I would be done. And I have to put my faith in a higher power and take a step blindly into the unknown and just trust like if there's love in my heart, and I'm really here to do good things and, and make a positive impact on the world. Even if you fail, you win. Like it's there, there is no real losing in that. So even if we run into some other roadblock and this company ends up not doing the thing that I wanted to do or expecting it to do, I'm not even afraid of that anymore. And I think that's like a bulletproof fear because I know that I'll find a way to make that impact in some other way, no matter what, you know, I, I remember when we had early on, we were coaching and I was moving from a tattoo artist to a coach and it was a really hard transition. And you, we had that deep conversation. I was, some tears were shed. You were like, are you, are you like a hundred percent in this? Or are you just like 90%? Uh, and I was like, it was hard for me to let go of this identity because I've been tattooing full time for 13 years at the time. And I was like, I want this so bad. I want to change people's lives around money. I don't want people, I don't want artists to live with the burden of money. I want the creative dreamers and thinkers in this world to have freedom around money. And I want that so bad that I'm willing to let go of this strongly held identity. And that was when I, it was like I turned from a cucumber into a pickle and you can't turn a pickle into a cucumber. And so no matter what happens with this business, it's like my life is in service of making an, a positive impact and I will walk blindly forward, march forward with that, you know, that intention at all times. Beautiful. I think that's an awesome place to wrap and love what you're doing. Always love collaborating. Um, where should people go to learn more about what you guys are up to? Well, if you're not a tattoo artist, too bad. No, um, <laughs> you can find me on Instagram, Ryan Roy Tattoo, R-Y-A-N-R-O-I. 
People always ask me, is that your real last name, Ryan Roy? Because Roy, R-O-I, return yeah. on investment. It's my real last name. I was born with that, my parents. Ryan Roy <laughs> Tattoo. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where most of the good stuff is. I also have a podcast, The Artful Dollar. Um, check that out. People seem to really like it because uh, we get yeah a lot of good reviews and stuff like that. So I'm just going to keep sharing it, keep shining my light. I was thinking the other day, I was like, how many points do I earn in the Lighthouse game now? It's probably like <laughs> a thousand points a month if I had to tally it up, you know? But it just happens effortlessly now. I'm not worried about earning points. I'm just, I'm just shining my light brightly and regularly. If you like it, great. If you don't, that's cool. Amazing. Love you, brother. Thanks for taking yeah. the time. Love you too. Thanks, Greg.